Hello again and welcome back to Illegally Cited. This is Jesse here and I am back for a combination channel update and event video. I want to talk to you about a few uh, channel updates coming up here. And then I just wanted to give some thoughts and kind of a recap on this week's game accessibility conference that happened on Monday and Tuesday. That is the playlist that we are kind of looking at in the background uh, of this video here, and I will put a link in the description below so you guys can check out all of their sessions are already up, divide it all nice into their playlist so you can check those out uh, after this video. So <clears throat> anyway, um, quick little, you know, a few channel updates and life updates and other stuff. Um, if you are new to the channel, thank you for checking it out. Thank you for watching the video. Um, I do release videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Mondays are stream archives from twitch.tv slash illegally cited. You can follow me there as well. So stream archives will be on Mondays. And then <clears throat> everything else is Wednesday and Saturday. So um, PC or iOS accessible, blind accessible games could be low vision spotlight games, just playing games with low vision. Hardware reviews, uh, VR accessibility, VR games or apps, uh, any number of different things, event coverage, you know, all kinds of stuff. So everything is divided into playlists. Check those out. Hopefully you find something that will be of interest to you and to everyone else who has been uh, supporting and following the channel for a time. Definitely much appreciated. Um, thank you again. And someone had asked me just the other day, I haven't really been paying attention really at all for, I don't remember how long, but somebody asked me how my channel was doing, so I looked at my dashboard, and I was actually rather surprised to learn that, uh, yeah, Illegally Cited just passed 3,000 subscribers. So, yeah, thank you to everybody for that. I, I knew that we were getting fairly close, and I wasn't sure if we were going to hit it, by the end of 2021 and actually we hit it with pretty good chunk of time to spare so who knows what we'll be at by the end of the year but again thanks to everybody for that that is kind of a quick channel update there's been lots of things happening on the channel i've had my iphone um, 13 pro max hardware review i've had that now for about what three weeks or so <clears throat> i'm still really liking that uh, everything in the video definitely still applies. Like it, I will say using um, with its better camera, like using the built-in magnifier app um, around the apartment, or even to look at like a computer screen or a console screen. Like I use it on my Switch OLED, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it 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 works really well. I mean, even from the 10s Max, I noticed that the f camera focus is just a lot quicker. Uh, it seems like you might even be able to zoom in a little bit more than you could before, but the image is generally just really clear, and uh, yeah, I really love, I use the phone as a CCTV a lot. And yes, the camera, you know, I've only had it a week when I did that video, but ever since, man, the camera, on, or not the camera, the battery life on this thing is a beast. You want a phone with a good battery life, man, yeah, the iPhone 13 Pro Max, you're going to pay a little bit for it, but... Holy crap. Yeah, the battery is quite good. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really liking the phone so far. It's been working out great. Um, you know, but we've had a lot of different... There's, It's, it's amazing because earlier this year, I wasn't sure, you know, with all the delays and the pandemic messing everything up and all that stuff, I wasn't sure what we were really going to have this fall. But, man... Even excluding AAA, like, yes, there's a few AAA games here and there that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, Back, for, Back for Blood being one of them. Maybe, you know, maybe the uh, Halo Infinite. Uh, a couple other ones here and there. But, I mean, there's so many just, like, indie games and just all kinds of stuff that I really um, need to get around to playing or that are coming out that just look really interesting, really fun. So... Yeah, there's plenty of content to go around. Um, so, you know, definitely check out some of the recent videos. There's been a lot of different things. Um, and there definitely will be more. As I said, there are so many games. Like, I'm so far behind on my backlog. I want to get around to Psychonauts, too. I want to get around to... Pff, 
there's at least a good half a dozen or more games that have been out in the last month or two that I would like to get around to, not to mention everything else that I've just had in my pile of shame forever. Um, and like I said, we got Back for Blood that literally just came out yesterday, officially. Um, we have Halo Infinite later, late in December. Um, we've got, oh god, I don't know, there, there's just all kinds of stuff. There's some retro shooters popping out here and there. We've had some demos I've gotten to play through Steam Next Fest and because of uh, Realms Deep. So there's all kinds of fun stuff happening. Um, so definitely look forward to all of that. And, you know, we're going to have a couple other hardware things because let me tell you guys, this past three weeks or so, four weeks or so, has been kind of rough on the old wallet. Thank God I uh, am pretty decent at saving money these days because, oof, it's, it's feeling the pain <laughs> this last month. Uh, because, I, like I said, I got the iPhone 13 Pro Max. And then, you know, I had the Switch OLED pre-ordered. Uh, when when they first allowed pre-orders, because I'm like, well, with all the chip shortages, hey, if I can get one pre-ordered and it and it's not sold out, or you know, people aren't scalping them so there's no one available for anyone else, okay, I'll, I'll pre-order it, and then if I want to cancel, I I will later. And honestly, even about you know three days before it shipped, I was really really close to canceling the pre-order because I'm just like. Yeah, I want the OLED screen. It's a bigger screen. It's a sharper screen. It will really help me visually. But there's no performance increase. It's not going to run in games any higher frame rate or, or any better. Um, it's really the screen, a little bit better battery, and, you know, a couple minor odds and ends here and there. And I was really, I was so close to canceling the pre-order. And I'm like, you know what? <sighs> Screw it. Um, I decided to keep it. And uh, I got it on Saturday. thought it was going to come on Friday, but it didn't. Um, came on Saturday, so I transferred all my save data and profile onto the new one and played quite a bit of it this weekend. A little bunch of different games, a lot of Castlevania Advance Collection, um, all that good stuff. So I will have a hardware review of that. I'm hoping that'll be Saturday's video if I can get it recorded I like to play a little bit more of it as well. So, like I said, I'm hoping for this Saturday's video, but you know, maybe next week. But hopefully, in the near in the near future, we'll have a Switch OLED uh, hardware review for you guys. I'll give you my more thoughts on that. Um, but so far, I'm digging it pretty well. <sighs> and then we're not done. No, we're not. Um, so, new phone, new Switch. Nah. Well. So a few weeks ago, my friend, he's been on the channel in the past a uh, time or three. Uh, his computer, his desktop computer, just t completely crapped out. His motherboard had died, essentially. So he was looking for a new rig. I had been thinking about, you know, possibly upgrading my rig. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to wait till the first after the first of the year. You know, Windows 11 will be out, yada, yada. But I, I'd been toying with the idea... Heck, even when Riley was up here, I'm like, well, maybe the around the end of 2020 I'll upgrade. And then COVID and scalpers and chip shortages and all this other nonsense. And I just said, yeah, I'll wait. Um, but, uh, yeah, my friend, he <laughs> his computer died, so he was looking for a new rig. I was kind of helping him. I was looking at a few different models myself for his curiosity and mine. And then he found one. Um you know, normally the last couple of machines I get, uh, I have like either a friend of mine will help me build it or I'll get a local like computer shop to build it for me because that way you know exactly what's in, in the machine. There's no bloatware. There's no extra crap in there. And it's just, you know, I, I, that's the way I generally like to do it. But even a lot of PC builders these days are kind of at least starting with pre-built machines because it's honestly, right now, I think it's the cheaper way to go because... <laughs> Especially if you're looking at a high-end gaming machine with a decent video card, because, oh man, um, I was doing a search not long ago, about a week ago, I just wanted to see what RTX 3080 cards cost. These are retail 700 buck cards, so they're expensive as it is. 
But with shortages and scalpers and bit mining and all kinds of other crap that's going on right now, the cheapest one I could find was 1800 bucks, And they averaged about 2400 so I'm like, two to three times more? <laughs> no, absolutely not. So, um, he sent me the link. He bought a machine, a pre-built. And then I was looking at his. I saw kind of off on the side there. I'm like, ooh, there's a similar model that's got a little more spec. Let me see what I can do with this thing. So, yeah, um, I don't have it yet, but uh, I have a new desktop coming to me, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Hopefully I'll have it up and running by the end of the month. We'll see what happens. But this thing, do you, this thing, you guys, is going to be smoking. Um, we got a new Core i7. Yes, I still went Intel, um, but I got a Core i7, um, the new newest gen. We've got an RTX 3080, and we have 64 gigabytes of RAM. So yeah, plenty of RAM there. We have, um, you know, one terabyte uh, NVMe solid state drive. So it's going to be stupid fast for uh, the operating system and such. And then I also have a secondary two terabyte NVMe solid state drive. So this thing is going to kick some serious ass. Like loading times are going to be way faster than they were. This the machine. Yeah, I'm looking forward to playing with it. Um, it's going to be pretty cool. I mean, don't get me wrong. The current rig that I have has seen me through a lot these last five, six years. And I still love it. Like if it weren't for the fact that it literally, I can't upgrade to windows 11. I don't have a new enough processor, uh, generation to do it. I don't have a, this hardware TPM chip in there for security that when Microsoft requires, and, you know, the graphics card that I have, it's, like I said, there's games that it just won't run. Um, there's been at least probably, I mean, the ones that I wanted to play, I would say at least two to three games already that I have not been able to. I'm like, yeah, no, my, my machine is probably just going to burst into flames or something. So, yeah, new PC coming in. Um, and I... I normally wouldn't have thought this way, but after looking at a bunch of models, for people that are curious, I actually decided to try an HP Omen. It's a 30L is what they call it. It's a, it's a series that you can get a whole bunch of configurations in. But it's a higher-end gaming HP Omen desktop. So that's what we're going to... Um, I'll talk more about that in a future video. And yeah, so... After all that nonsense, yes, my wallet is uh, definitely feeling the pain. So we're definitely going to be backing off uh, many purchases for quite a while because I should be good now for a few years <laughs> for hardware. But um, so that's some of the things you can kind of look forward to. You know, I'll give some thoughts on, do some reviews on the computer, the Switch. Um, there might be one other surprise. I'm not exactly sure when it's coming, but um, I'm not going to say any more. Um, there, but there's going to be something really, really cool coming in the next couple of months. So a lot to look forward to. Um, there is a Google event, like I think next week <clears throat> for the Pixel 6. I don't know that I'm going to cover it unless they cover a lot of new, like besides the Pixel, like everything is kind of leaked about it. Uh, it seems like anyway, just like everything else. I don't know if they're going to do a bunch of like, um, Android updates or something like, you know, tell, talk about some new features or launch other products besides the Pixel. So probably I'm not, maybe not going to cover that too much on the channel. Apple is also going to be having another event later this month. I forget the exact date, but it's mainly about the Mac. I don't know if they're going to throw any sort of iPad or AirPods or anything like that in there. And, you know, I, I, I don't know that I'm going to, I mean, I might talk about it in one of these channel update videos, just a few tidbits here and there, but honestly, like I have zero interest right now in a Mac. So that just doesn't really, I, I can't speak to like Mac stuff expertly at all. I use it 
I use one at work from time to time here and there, but even then it's very basic. So I'm not the guy for matte coverage. And like I said, I just bought a beast of a PC. So there's that. So I think we're kind of hopefully done with uh, being a bunch of events here. Um, but we do have the Game Awards coming up later this year. And the cool thing is, is um, I was asked to be, if I was interested in being another a judge for the accessibility category this year, which they are continuing. So huge thank you uh, to the crew for that. So I might be doing that later this year a little bit, being involved a little bit with the Game Awards, which is awesome. And uh, yeah, speaking of games and events, the Game Accessibility Conference 2021. We had the European version earlier this year. And then Monday and Tuesday this week, we had the U.S. version, which means I didn't have to get up at 3 in the morning to watch it live. Yay! Um, but man, yeah, they went from being a one-day conference to, I think they started it, uh, I think it was in the earlier, the European one, where they started it as a two-day. Because when I went to California, it was still a one-day conference. Um... But yes, it is now a two-day conference, and there's a lot of great sessions here. So I've got the playlist up. Like I said, I will leave a link in the description so you guys can check that out. But we have, you know, two full days worth of sessions here, and there's a lot of them. I'm not going to go through, like, each one in detail. I would definitely highly recommend, you know, checking out this playlist and just seeing what... Um, uh, what categories interest you, but there was, I mean, I learned a lot, like, and especially working in game accessibility, if you want to work, you know, if you want to be an advocate, or if you want to be a consultant, you want to be both, whatever, um, I think it's important to really learn, you know, a little bit about other disabilities, like, for me, yes, I highly, um, you know, I'm, I'm highly focused on blind and low vision accessibility because that's what I know. That's what I've been living with for the past 40 plus years. Yeah, I know I'm old. Um, but I also don't want to just advocate for me. I want gaming to be more inclusive uh, and accessible to everybody. So, you know, knowing what types of um, needs other people have, you know, maybe they have a learning, a learning disability or maybe they have cognitive or cognitive uh, hearing impairment, mobility impairment, whatever it happens to be, I want to kind of be at least somewhat familiar. Like, I can't speak for those groups of people, but if, you know, let's say a developer asks, you know, I can kind of be like, oh, well, you know, here's some people that you might be able to contact, and here's a couple of general tips that I just, you know, know of, you know, for like subtitles or button remapping or whatever it happens to be. And a lot of these features, you know, they can be helpful for multiple groups you know it's like oh configuring um you know controls helps a lot of people or um just all kinds of different things so there was a lot of cool sessions um i always look forward to the first session of these shows especially the last couple of years because ian starts kicks off the show e, mr sir ian of hamilton uh kicks off the show with kind of a recap of what has happened within the last year or even within the last six months or so, because like I said, we had the European version of GA conf earlier this year and just, he couldn't even cover all the stuff, like all the games that have featured accessibility features or improvements. Uh, but there is so much news that has happened. Just watch his uh, session to know I mean, yes, there is absolutely a long way to go. We have a lot of work to do. But I'm encouraged at how, not just how many more games are coming out with accessibility features and, like, how many more types of accessibility are being included, but, like, the the speed of the of these increases is, like, exponential. Like, you know, we had maybe... Several years ago, we had a trickle of like, oh, we have an accessibility feature here, an accessibility feature there, you know, one game here, one game there. And it was like this big deal if one game managed to put one or two features in. And it's like a snowball rolling down a hill. It's like it just collects more and more snow. And we got pretty soon we got this giant boulder of, you know, 
boulder of snowball accessibility just shooting down the hill, which is awesome because, yeah, I mean, the stuff that's happened in the last six months is really cool. There was another session on the second day in the morning where they were kind of giving a more broad history of the last 10 years of accessibility, and that even showcases more. You know, like I said, we had this little trickle. We had a few games here and there. And then, like, 2015 or so, that's when we really started... I think that's when things really sort of kicked off. Uh, and it's just been getting better and faster uh, ever since. So those two sessions, I think, were really cool. Um, if you watch me on the Twitch stream, or if you've seen the two out of three episodes so far of The Veil that I did the audio RPG that is on PC and Xbox right now. Um, the developers did a session on The Veil, kind of a post-mortem of you know, what they found, what worked, what didn't, some of their plans, what they'd like to do for the future. Um, I thought it was a pretty cool talk. You know, um, well, We've talked to them in the past, um, and uh, it's just a really cool thing there. So if you're interested in audio games, definitely check that session out. They had a few different sessions on blindness-related stuff. Uh, there was another one, and I don't know that I'm really going to cover these types of games because they just fly way over my head, and it's not really a genre that I'm interested in too much. Um, but there was a session later that first morning on this accessible flight simulator project. where the, And it's cool because what I, one thing that stood out to me is they said, okay, well, some of these, you know, these interfaces that are being made for the sighted users, they're just not accessible. You know, we just, we can't get a screen reader to work with them. So they created their sort of own interface, but what they did was when creating that interface, <clears throat> they created as closely as humanly possible to the sighted version so that the cool thing is, let's say you wanted to really get into accessible flight simulation. Um, what you could do is you could still watch like all these tutorial videos and like, you know, people just go down this deep rabbit hole of, you know, simulating all these planes and stuff. You could go watch a sighted person's video. And as they talk about as as long as they, <clears throat> you know, audibly describe kind of what, what to do and what they're doing, um, because the blind interface is so similar to the sighted interface like you can actually go watch some of these cited tutorial and YouTube videos and learn how to do it from just the way that anybody else would because your interface, even though it's a different interface, it's they design it to be very close to the same. So that was a really cool thing. Um, oh, they had one on audio description. Uh, audio description in like game trailers. We're starting to see that more or events. You know, we've had like the Ubisoft, I think, did a really good job this past E3. Microsoft, they're trying, but yeah, I think they, they need a little more work. Um, you, you know, they, some of their stuff, like their, their recent Xbox event, like they had it, but not everything was totally described, which was bizarre. Uh, some people didn't like the fact that they used text-to-speech. I would have maybe rather had a human narrator, but that's not the end of the world for me, as long as the speech isn't terrible. Um, but they did have a session on audio descriptions. So, like I said, audio like trailers, you know, like the Assassin's Creed one that they featured recent or last year, um, events... And even, you know, potentially down the road, you could have um, cutscene described. So you could have an extra, you know, there's games right now where you can choose between the, just like a movie, there's games where you can choose between like English and Japanese or English and Spanish or whatever it happens, maybe several languages. So, you could, you know, just like you do with uh, a lot of these digital movies or movies on disc, um, a game could have a separate audio check that includes audio description at least for the linear stuff, you know, because it's a little hard to describe, you know, like actual non-linear gameplay because you never know what the player is going to do. But even having like cutscenes and stuff could be really helpful. 
So that was an interesting blind related session. Um, but like I said, I learned just as much, if not more, by the other sessions that weren't about blindness. Um, you know, they had a panel, um, they always have panels of users. Like I said, I was in the 2019 one. You can look that one up. And that was focused on low vision. Well, this year they had a panel um, with like, what was it, three or four different, yeah, four different um, people with the varying mobility impairments, motor impairments. And it was a really interesting, the, all the people were really good. They were really entertaining. Uh, and I love the host of it. I think his name was Paul. He was a cool dude. Um, but that was really interesting. Just talking about, you know, them talking about the challenges that they have and what they would like to see from developers and things like that. It was, it was actually a really good session. Another one that I really enjoyed was the, can I play that? It was like that, that site has been around for three years now. And it was really just, it was a really good, honest look about their journey so far. And if you're not familiar, can I play that? is a website where they're trying to get, you know, they're trying to provide accessibility reviews and accessibility news and information. They, they started with just reviews, but then they expanded to news a little while ago. And they just really want to be kind of a, a good place to go if you're looking for game accessibility information. Um... And, you know, she talked about, like, what worked, what didn't work, some of the things that she struggled with. And, like, you know, well, I was taking too much on originally myself. I really ended up needing help and, you know, hiring staff. And, you know, like, people that write for them, you know, they want to be fair and treat it just like, you know, a mainstream journalist, be it a, like, standard news journalist or a gaming journalist, whatever, um, you know, paying people for their work or for their efforts, um, getting funding so that they can continue and expand their coverage and work more with developers. I mean, these are things that, you know, any sort of, you know, even creators like myself, um, you know, I kind of think about or struggle with, you know, like I said, I don't get a lot of review codes. Yes, I get a couple here and there. Um, and part of me is like, I know that I could, my YouTube channel is well established enough. I've been doing it for what, eight, nine years now. Um, and you know, it's not a huge following, but 3000 isn't too bad. Um, and, but I just, I still like, I, I could, I could justify it as, you know, I, I do try to provide accessibility information to people. That's what I'm hoping to accomplish largely with this channel. And so I could, you know, I treat it that way. Um, but I just, I kind of like, I will sometimes, but I just, I, I really have a little bit of trouble talking to like, you know, just cold calling or like, you know, sending an email or whatever, just cold contacting like a developer or a publisher, like, Hey, uh, can you give me a review code? Like, I don't want to, I, I don't want to feel like I'm entitled, like, Oh, well, I'm not going to do it unless I get my code for free. Um, I mean, like I said, the amount of, <laughs> we don't even want to know how much money I've spent in the last decade on games and technology. We're not even going to go there, but, um, you know, I mean, yeah, review codes would help, um, would help cut down on some of the expenses. I mean, game pass is a hugely beneficial thing because Hey, if something comes out on game pass, just go download it or stream it or try it. Um, that's a nice, really nice thing. But, um, so it was just a really, really good session. Just, you know, really just throwing it out there, you know, not a lot of fluff to say, like, Hey, this is how it is. Um, really interesting session. There was a session on the second day that was a little controversial. Um, there was a lot of people that really rubbed people the wrong way and I can see both sides. Um, it was this session, um, about Minecraft EDU. It's a spinoff of Minecraft and I've kind of, I don't know if I'm able to check it out as a user. Um, uh, like, I don't know if you have to be affiliated with like a school or how that works, but it sounds sort of fascinating. But what they were actually talking about was they were talking about basically 
changing the interview process. So, you know, you go to interview for a job and, you know, the old school interview way, you sit down in a room with one or multiple people and they just grill you with a bunch of questions. It depends on the place. Some of them may be, you know, like I've had all kinds of weird, in, you know, in interviews in the past where, you know, it could be anything. Tell me about yourself. What do you like, you know, what do you like to do? Or, you know, how what, what would you do in this scenario? Or they would ask you technical questions. Or they would ask you what you knew about the business. Or any number of things. So they were like, well, you know, some people have the skills. They just don't interview. Like, it's kind of like how people, some people don't take tests quite as well. Um, but they can, but they know the work. Um so they're like, well, what if we created, like, what if we had this Minecraft environment that they could, you know, they, they created a, 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 a map of the Microsoft campus that you could walk around. They had, like, activities that people would participate in. And it largely sounded kind of neat. But again, it's sort of, like, I thought it was sort of interesting. And I wouldn't mind doing an interview or doing something like that. It would be kind of neat. Um, but there are problems with it too. Uh, for one, um, there are a few, there are becoming a couple of Minecraft mods that are making pieces of the game, uh, accessible and it's getting better all the time. You know, there's native text to speech for a lot of the menus, but there's actually some mods that are making the gameplay itself more accessible. Um, and I will probably look into that in the future, especially as things get more established. Um, so, but the thing is it, you know, the interview process may not be accessible to blind users in that case. Also, you know, it's like, well, is this, or is this the right way to approach it? Because, you know, some people are not gamers. Some people maybe don't want to be in a game. They just would rather answer a few questions. Um, but th there were all kinds of really interesting, especially for like neurodiverse, um, you know, during the, the whole session, the reason I wanted to watch it live is because they had the discord, their discord channel going and each session had their own room while we were watching. And I can't really get into it all here. Um, I mean, there was really good discussion. It was still really good friendly open discussion but yeah that session like i said you'd have to watch to kind of really know but it did rub people a lot of people the wrong way and triggered some people um like i said i can see both sides to it where they're coming from um it's it's an interesting balance but that was one of the sessions that kind of stood out for different reasons so you know i mean hey and even if people don't necessarily follow you know if if they don't really like the content as much of the of the session like i said with the discord being the being that this is a digital conference this year at least you know like the discussion was really good so it was still really a helpful session because it got people thinking a, a lot about a lot of different things there was another session from the roblox people um you know this is a I've never really looked at it. I've never really had much interest, but it's it's kind of a Minecrafty thing, but you can create all kinds of like your own games and there's all kinds of stuff that you can do, but they were talking about how they're trying to embrace accessibility culture and add accessibility features to their game, um, Roblox. But what's really cool about it is... Even if the game, let's say, I don't think it, I'm pretty sure it's not totally blind accessible, but what's really cool is this is a game that's huge with little kids nowadays. And since it's really focused on creation, you can kind of create your own, not only just create your characters or worlds, but you can create different types of games within Roblox. And the thing is, is as part of that, they're having these little like workshops or in-game activities that you can do, and they're actually stressing accessibility. So as kids are learning to kind of make games or make game content, you know, they're learning, oh, maybe I should think about accessibility. Maybe I want to make sure that all my friends can play the game that I make. So they're kind of, I really like the fact that they're being introduced to technology and game accessibility from such a young age because like i said this is 
like huge for young kids. Um, so that is a, that, that could be a really nice advantage, uh, to them embracing that kind of thing. Oh God, what else was there? There, like I said, there was so many, oh, there was an Ian Hamilton. He did another session on day two, you know, the old reoccurring debate accessibility versus difficulty. This is a micro talk. It was like five, what, five minutes or so, five, 10 minutes tops, but he nailed it, man. I really love, he, he laid out the definitions. He explained how they connect with each other. They, he explained, you know, like just, just watch the session. If you watch it, anything, watch that session. Cause it's just, it was just short, sweet, totally go Ian. Um, um, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, of course, Insomniac, they wrapped it up. They had, you know, they talked about their journey with accessibility, you know, um, starting with like the Spider-Man game that came out on the PS4. And then they had Spider-Man Miles Morales, Ratchet and Clank this year. Um, and I really like the way they're thinking about it. You know, they're always looking to improve. They're like, you know, and that was kind of the big thing. It's like, oh, we know we could do more, but we're just trying to do as much as we can. We want to get the low hanging fruit and prove, you know, cause uh, like I said, you know, people and understandably, like I said, I know a lot of people, a lot of, especially blind and visually impaired players are like, well, yeah, that's great. All these accessibility features are coming, but what about us? We can't play in hardly any of these games. And I get that it sucks. And some of them I can't even play with low vision because it's really hard. But I'm glad that they're still advancing because A, they're learning. They're adding features over time with every new game. And here's the other thing is if they can prove, here's the other thing that we really haven't touched on. If they can prove to their upper management, you know, because everything has to be prioritized. You know, it's all about what they have time to develop, what is going to, you know, return on investment. You know, they're a, they're a game company, yes, but they still want to make money so they can survive. And as they add some of these features, even if they're not for you, hopefully they can say, oh, well, look at how many people use subtitles. Look at how many people used controller remapping. Look at how many people used the high contrast features, as they add all these new features, then they can go see how many more people were attracting and how much positive, not only positive reaction from players, but press articles, reviews and everything, all of that stuff adds up. And so if they can prove to the decision makers and say, you know what? Yes, let's, you know, this is working. Let's go even further and try to hit these people that we've left out, AKA blind people. So I know, like I said, it is frustrating because there are games that I really, really want to play that I, I can't even really do that well, if at all. Um, but that is one thing that they really touched on that I really found to be, you know, really good. Um, oh, the other one that I really liked, uh, we'll wrap it up here shortly, but there's at least one other session that I really want to mention the Ubisoft uh, session, and they talked about playtesting, and that was really interesting because I've done, I've, I've now done one or two different playtests from a couple of places. I'm not, I can't really talk about my a lot of experience with them due to NDAs, but um, like I said, I I was able to test Far Cry Six early this year. Um, you know, we can say that much. And just going through that process and, you know, seeing it from the player's perspective, I found it really fascinating um, hearing about how they approached it from the developer side. And, you know, they talked about Far Cry 6. And so, like, having literally been in that session, or, you know, in that group, I'm like, oh, okay. And just, I don't know, I, I just found it to be really interesting you know, how they wanted to like approach people, how they wanted to accommodate play sessions, how they were going to take that feedback and actually try to put it into the game. Um, it was just, uh, I found it to be a really interesting session. So, uh, those are the main ones that I, like I said, they were all good. 
they were all interesting. There were a few, there were a couple of sessions on hearing impairments. Like there were a couple of ones on <clears throat> like captions and subtitles. There was one on the metaverse where there were, or that was the Roblox one. But, um, but like I said, there were hearing impairment ones. There was motor, uh, there was some cognitive stuff. Oh, there was a session on horror games. And oh man, like if you watch that one, the, <laughs> the horror game one, um, when, um, when Tara was doing her part, I even tweeted this. I replied to her post on Twitter. I said, man, like when you were talking all in, this doesn't even, what I said is this doesn't even just apply to horror games, but like when she was talking and the things that she was complaining about in horror games, it was like she was reading my mind. Like I was literally typing in the discord and before it happened, I'm like, yeah, this is a kind of frustrating and I wish they would do this. And then and, and she would say it. I mean, cause these were pre-recorded sessions that we would watch. And then, you know, the host would be there of each session. They would talk in the discord with everybody. But, um, like I literally, I was thinking them and then she would say that exact thing. I'm like, yes, thank you. Thank you. That is so exactly what I want, what I, what we need. So, um, bec there were just, you know, things like, you know, insta fail missions or, you know, things being really dark or tiny text or, the, I mean, just Tara's section of that presentation specifically like, oh man, um, saying exactly what I was thinking pretty much. So those are just some highlights that I found, um, from the last two days of the game accessibility conference. Um, definitely check out the playlist because these sessions are worth watching. These are just some of my thoughts and, and, uh, kind of a recap of some of my highlights of the show. And if you have the chance in the future, when they eventually, because they have to inevitably go back to in-person um, in the future, I really, 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 really hope that they are able to, I hope they don't just do it live and in-person. I hope they are able to, even if they just put, you know, they can have their Discord channel for any home users still, but I hope they have a camera, you know, even one camera, one or one or two cameras that could point at the front of the of the 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 room, and I really hope they stream even the future in person events, so it can be a combination of in person and virtual. For because again, again, many people are not going to be able to attend, whether it's financial or time or work or whatever it happens to be. Um, now that they've done it digitally, um, I hope they can put a live camera. I don't know whether they do it through Twitch or if they would do it through a YouTube stream. Um, I would be good with both. So that's a piece of feedback that I would have. Please uh, don't forget about people in the future who are not able to attend virtually because I will attend this sucker every time in the future. So anyway, I've babbled long enough. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Again, there's a lot of stuff coming. We have lots of new toys to play with. We got a new switch. We got a new PC coming in. Got a bunch of new games, lots of stuff to watch. I literally just watched the, I totally forgot about it until I saw something notification on my phone. I just checked out the first episode of the Chucky series that is on sci-fi watched it through google tv and it's pretty good they still got the original uh, actor for charles lee ray and he's up to all kinds of shenanigans so i'm definitely curious about that you know it being halloween so i'm gonna follow that but there's a lot of shows i want to watch there's movies there's games all kinds of stuff so lots to look forward to hope you guys enjoyed the video like the video if you did Subscribe if you have not done so already. Follow me on Twitter at BGFH79. I'm very active there. Follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash illegally cited. And you can follow me at illegally cited.com and right here on YouTube. So until next time, I will chat with everybody again later.